Hello, so this video is part of DNA and Cell Division and the first little part is all about DNA and how it works. So before we get into this there's some key words and terms. Firstly, the nucleus of a cell contains chromosomes. So if we draw out a typical animal cell, that's the nucleus. And within the nucleus there are chromosomes. Chromosomes carry genes, which control all of your characteristics. So if we were to take out one of these chromosomes and look at it, we would see there's these little bands on it. And these little bands are the genes. So here's the nucleus. Here's a chromosome. And on that, there are genes. Chromosomes can occur, occur in pairs. So in humans, there are 23 pairs in each cell. So there's a total of 46 to get all together. So 23 pairs. So basically, because there's one of each chromosome in a pair, and there's 23 of them, all together you've got 46 chromosomes. So both are correct to say. You can either say that there are 23 pairs of chromosomes in a human cell, or there is 46 chromosomes in each human cell. And then gametes, or sex cells, contain half the number of chromosomes. Okay, now this little bit, half the number of chromosomes. So we sometimes say that gametes are haploid, which means they've got half the number of chromosomes, whereas these other human cells are diploid. And then this diagram just shows the same thing that we've just talked about. So we've got the cell with the nucleus in it. Within the nucleus, we've got chromosomes and each chromosome is divided into many genes. Now, genes then are short lengths of DNA, which code for proteins. We're gonna see how that works later on, but basically, the genes code for proteins, and then the proteins determine your characteristics. So depending on what proteins are produced where, that's what that cell will do. Now, this is what DNA is. So it's a chemical, and it's known as deoxyribonucleic acid. So there's deoxyribonucleic acid. The next little part is about the structure of DNA. So when we're describing the structure of DNA, we can basically look at it in two parts. We can look at its 3D structure. Now this is described as a double helix. And it is this sort of shape where we've got a length with two little twists in it. And each separate strand is joined together by bases. So its 3D structure is known as a double helix, which is basically like a ladder, which has two twists in it, like this. So here we have a ladder, then we have a first twist, then we have a second twist, and that's the 3D structure, the double helix. The next thing we can look at is its molecular structure. So DNA is made up of nucleotides. Each nucleotide is made up of three parts. A sugar, a phosphate, and a base. Now the sugar, first of all, is called deoxyribose. The phosphate is a little phosphate molecule, and the base then can be one of four. It can be adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine or sometimes they're just A, T, 
G and C. Now, what this means is that because the sugar is always deoxyribose in DNA and the phosphate is always phosphate, but the bases can be any one of four. So that means that DNA can be made up of four different nucleotides. So there's four different possible nucleotides for DNA, but let's have a look at how they're made up. So each nucleotide contains the phosphate, the sugar, which is deoxyribose, and one of four bases. And remember the bases can be adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. So there's four possible types of nucleotides that DNA can have. So here we have this part, which is the phosphate and the sugar. So the sugar phosphate backbone. And we have it on either side. Then in the middle, we have the bases, which are drawn in these boxes. And down here at the bottom, you can see one nucleotide, which is made up of the phosphate, the sugar, and the base. Now, as I was saying, these don't just line up in any random order. What happens is one nucleotide, which contains adenine on one side of the sugar phosphate chain, has to link up with thymine on the other side. So you'll notice here that everywhere there's an A, it lines up with a T. T and A, and likewise G lines up with C. And this is known as complementary base pairing. So this means that A will always pair with T and G will always pair with C. This little thing in the middle is a hydrogen bond. So it basically just means that the A and the T pair up with hydrogen bonds and the G and the C pair up with the hydrogen bonds. Now what we should look at before we go any further is just putting this complementary base pairing rule to the test. So if a strand of DNA is 31% adenine, what is the total amount of thymine, cytosine and guanine? Well remember A must equal T and G must equal C. So if 31% is adenine, that means that 31% is thymine. 31 plus 31, whoops, is 62. 100% minus 62 equals 38. Now that 38% is equal to G plus C. So if we do 38 divided by 2, we get 19. So that means 19% of it guanine, 19% of it is cytosine. Pause it here and see if you can work out the next one. And here's the answer to the next one. So this just shows a quick diagram showing how adenine likes to bond with thymine. And then this cool diagram just shows you some sweet necklaces and friendship bracelets you can have. Woo! Now what we've just found out is that there's only four different nucleotides. Yet people's DNA are quite different and people look very different from each other. So how is DNA different from different people? So what we're saying is that the DNA someone has determines their characteristics. But there are only four different types of nucleotides, A, T, G and C. So how is everyone so different? And this is because different people have different base sequences on their chromosomes. Therefore, they will have differences in their characteristics. Now, what that means is, if we were to look at one strand of somebody's DNA, let's say, for example, Joe, and along one side of his DNA, he had this base sequence, A, T, G, C, A, T, T. Whereas... Carol, on the same chromosome, her base sequence might be A, T, T, T. 
T, G, C, A. So we can see there that because they have got different base sequences, they will have differences in their characteristics. We're going to find out why that is shortly. When we look at how DNA actually works and how it codes for different things. So before we go any further, a few little questions. So pause it here and try and answer these questions. And two more just before we look at the answers. So here's the answers for it so far. And for the next answers. So how does DNA work then? Well, DNA codes for proteins, but it's not as direct as that. It's a little bit more indirect. So we know that DNA has a base sequence. So if we took one strand of DNA, and drew it out here, A, T, C, G, A, T, T, A, that would be its base sequence, which is just the order of bases along one strand. It gets read three bases at a time. So the first three are A, T, and C. The next three are G, A, T. Three bases codes for one amino acid. And lots of amino acids are bonded together to form a protein. So that's how DNA works. So let's look at a slightly different version of that. Here we have a cell with a nucleus with its chromosomes in it. So chromosomes contain the genes. Genes are the little bands on the chromosomes. Genes are made up of DNA. DNA is read three bases at a time. Each three bases, which is known as a base triplet, codes for one amino acid. An amino acid combines form proteins. So here we have our chromosome in the nucleus. And we've taken a little bit out. If we were looking at this really closely, it would have a little banded pattern. And we could work out its base sequence, which is just the order of the nucleotides on one, one side of the DNA strand. The base sequence gets read three bases at a time, or base triplet, and each three bases codes for an amino acid. Those amino acids then join up to form a protein. Now, a couple of things just to link together here. So, this is our chromosome. Earlier on we drew it out like that and we showed the little bands on it. So these are the little genes and what we're saying is these genes are made up of DNA. So this would basically be the little gene. This will code for a protein and it does that by getting read three bases at a time or a base triplet at a time to produce amino acid. The amino acids then link up to form a protein. Now as well as that, another thing to point out, you'll notice here amino acid 1 and amino acid 4 are both red. Now that's been done on purpose because the base sequence which coded for amino acid 1 was ATA and the one which codes for amino acid 4 is also ATA. So that means that amino acid 1 and 4 are actually the same amino acid. Now, what about some amino acid maths? Ooh. Now, remember, it takes three bases to code for one amino acid. The amino acids then join to form proteins. So let's say, for example, we had a protein with 177 amino acids. How many bases would it take to produce that? Well remember, three bases codes for one amino acid. So you would have to take 177, multiply by three, and that means that it would have taken 531 bases to code for that. Alternatively, if you had 333 bases, how many amino acids would that produce? Well, that would be 333 divided by 3, which would give you 111. 
amino acids.